Okay, I'm going to do an overview of the skull and answer the questions, what are the primary bones and sutures of the skull? What are the cranial fossae? And what openings do cranial nerves and vessels traverse? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So I'm going to cover the bones of the skull, the sutures, and the cranial fossae, and I'm going to start with the bones of the skull. So here's the frontal bone, and it gets its name because it's frontal, Latin, frontal is Latin for forehead, and it's the bone of your forehead. Then the zygomatic bone here is your cheekbone. And then your maxilla bone is here, and it's called maxilla because maxilla is Latin for jaw. It's your upper jaw. The parietal bone here in the lateral view of the skull is this one here in lime green, and parietal is Latin for wall. Whenever you see the word parietal, like parietal pleura, parietal pericardium, parietal peritoneum, or parietal bone, it's forming the wall of something. The temporal bone is this bone here in salmon color, and uh, temporal is Latin for time because if you were to add the ear, that is the area where gray hair is brought in. Gray hair comes with time, and that's where you usually start getting gray hair. Okay, so um, the petrous part of the temporal bone here on the lateral side is all right there. Now, I show that with an arrow, but you really don't see it because it's inside the temporal bone. And because the word petrous means rock, it's best to see that in a lateral x-ray. And it's the most dense, bright, or white area of an x-ray. It's a happy face for me if I find that. It helps me to find other structures. Now, the temporal bone is also the external acoustic meatus, which is right here. External for outside, acoustic for hearing, and meatus in the canal. It goes into your eardrum. It's that opening right there. Um, the sphenoid bone is this here. It's forming this wedge-shaped on the side of the skull. I'm going to talk more about that later. The mandible is here, and the mandible gets its name because it's Latin to chew, because it's the bone that allows you to move your jaw and chew or masticate. The occipital bone is here in this purple color, and occipital is Latin for the back of the skull or back of the skull. Um, now let's go from bones to sutures. Now sutures is Latin to bind, to sew, or a seam. It's like a stitch because here when you take a look, that's what it looks like is a stitch or a suture. And so early anatomists said, you know what also looks like a stitch? That. So they called it that. They used the word suture. Uh, the first suture we're going to cover is the coronal suture. It connects parietal and frontal bones. So here are the parietal and the frontal bones. And there is the coronal suture, and it courses in the coronal plane. The squamous suture connects parietal and temporal bones. So this lateral view, there's the parietal and temporal bones. And there is the squamous or squamosal suture. The lambdoid suture connects parietal and occipital bones. So there are the parietal bones, and there's the occipital bone, and that is the lambdoid suture. It gets its name because lambda is a Greek alphabet symbol that looks like that. And that's what the suture looks like. Now, the sagittal suture connects our parietal bones. So here's a superior view of the skull. There are our two parietal bones, and that is the sagittal suture, which runs right in the sagittal plane. The pterion is a small suture. It's connecting our parietal, frontal, sphenoid, and temporal bones right there. And it gets its name because this is where Hermes, the god, used to put wings as well as on his ankles is right there. And so that's why the pterion is called, is Latin for wing. Now let's go to cranial fossae. Now cranial fossae are three large stair-like depressions in the floor of the cranial cavity. So here's a sagittal section of the skull from a lateral view, and there's the anterior cranial fossa. A step down is the middle cranial fossa, and a step down is the posterior cranial fossa. And what separates the anterior middle cranial fossa is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, and the middle and posterior cranial fossa are separated by the back of the petrous part of the temporal bone. So let's take the calvarium off, remove it, and that's where we're going to see our cranial fossa is inside there. And so let's do that again. Our anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa, and the lesser wing separates our anterior and middle, and the petrous part of the temporal bone separates our middle and posterior cranial fossa. So let's talk about the anterior cranial fossa first. And inside that is the ethmoid bone there in green. And ethmoid is Latin or Greek, pardon me, for a sieve or strainer, something like that. Because doesn't the bone kind of look like that? Like you could do a colander with spaghetti through that or not spaghetti, but the water going through that. And so the cribriform bone has all of these holes called the cribriform foramina. The cribriform foramina, those openings, because inside the nasal cavity, our olfactory nerve ascends up to the bottom of the olfactory, to the ethmoid bone, and then those cribriform foramina allow for the traversing of the olfactory nerves to the olfactory bulb, which brings sensation of smell to the brain. 
All right, there's the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone in yellow, and it's what's separating our anterior and middle cranial fossae. All right, now let's go to the middle cranial fossa. Um, and two of the structures we begin are the optic canal and superior orbital fissure. There's the optic canal going into the orbit that way and the superior orbital fissure going into the orbit that way. But because we don't see a very good view of those two structures, I'm instead gonna take a look at the orbit from an anterior view. Here's the right orbit and there's the uh, optic canal, the superior orbital fissure, and the inferior orbital fissure, uh, I'll just throw in for extra. So let's do that again, except we're going to take and superimpose the schematic and blow it up to make it easier to see. Say optic canal, superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure. Now in the optic canal are two structures. We have cranial nerve two, also known as the optic nerve. That's what allows you to see. That's what goes to the retina. And right alongside that snug as a bug in a rug is the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch off the internal carotid artery, and it supplies the orbit as well as the retina. Now in the superior orbital fissure, we have a few things as well. There in blue is the superior ophthalmic vein that drains to the cavernous sinus, and also to the facial vein, and also the following cranial nerves, cranial nerve three, four, five, and six. Now, to be truthful, these four or uh, five structures are not in this order. They're in different orders, but it makes it easier for me to remember them, and since it's such a small space, it works. Cranial nerve three, four, V1, the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, and six. And then we have our inferior orbital fissure, and there's our inferior ophthalmic vein that goes to the cavernous sinus as well, um, and the pterygoid plexus of veins, as well as the facial vein, goes two ways. And then we have the cranial nerve V2, the infraorbital nerve. It's the continuation of the V2 branch from the foramen rotundum, and then our inferior orbital artery and vein. All right, there's all those structures. So now let's go back to the middle cranial fossa. We see the optic canal and superorbital fissure. Let's go to the next one here. And this is showing our cella turcica, which houses the pituitary gland. So here's the sagittal section, and there's the cella turcica. It gets its name because it means a Turkish saddle. I don't really see a Turkish saddle very often, but I guess that's what it looks like. And the pituitary gland goes shing and sits right inside that cella turcica. Um, next is the carotid canal that's located right there. Now the carotid canal is a canal, it goes one from the bottom of the skull and then into the middle cranial fossa. So let's zoom in on this one and go, there's our internal carotid artery and let's focus on there. And the bottom of the skull is there's the beginning of the carotid canal and then what we're looking at here in the middle cranial fossa is the other part of the carotid canal and the internal carotid artery traverses that, and this is where we're seeing right now, is inside the middle cranial fossa where the carotid canal exits. The frame and rotundum, frame and for opening and rotundum for round, and the frame and rotundum is what allows for a branch of the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, and it's specifically the V2 maxillary branch that goes through the frame and rotundum. So when we look in here, there's V2, and there's the frame and rotundum, and then that nerve goes through the infra. Uh, inferior orbital fissure and out the inferior orbital foramen. And also goes to your maxilla and palate. Now the foramen ovale gets its name for opening that is oval. And the V3 branch of the trigeminal nerve traverses that going through the foramen ovale and goes and enters into the infratemporal fossa and into the oral cavity. So V2 goes to the maxilla, V3 uh, goes to the mandible. The foramen spinosum is this very small opening, and it goes uh, traverses traversed by the middle meningeal artery, a branch off our maxillary artery, and it supplies the dura mater, and that is the terion, um, where the middle meningeal artery courses deep to it. So if you crack the terion, a very thin portion of the bone where that suture is, then you could rupture the middle meningeal artery and bleed, but separating the dura from the skull. That's a an epidural hematoma. Now let's go to the posterior cranial fossa. And inside the posterior cranial fossa, we have the internal acoustic meatus that goes into the petrous part of the temporal bone. And so there is our internal acoustic meatus, which is traversed by cranial nerve seven, facial nerve, and eight, vestibulocochlear nerve. And they all go into the internal ear where the semicircular canals and cochlea are. And those very delicate, important structures are housed in the hardest bone in the skull, the petrous part of the temporal bone. 
All right, so now we also have the jugular foramen that's right there, and it gets its name because jugular is Latin for neck or throat. Now, why is it called that? Well, there's the jugular foramen, and it's traversed by the internal jugular vein, which courses down into the neck. Now, the jugular foramen also has a few other things that go through it. This is a coronal section looking for the back of the skull. You have cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11 glossal pharyngeal, vagus, and spinal accessory that also traverse this jugular foramen. That's a big one. That's an important one. So the jugular foramen is traversed by our internal jugular vein and cranial nerve 9 and 10 and 11. I love it when nature put those nerves in order. It's very nice. Now, the hypoglossal canal is found at the front of the um, foramen magnum right there, and it's called hypoglossal because hypo is Greek for under and glossal for tongue because the nerve cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve traverses this opening and goes to all the muscles under the tongue and what moves your tongue. Okay. Base of the skull, the cranial fossa. Now we're looking at the inferior view of the skull. Okay. And the styloid process of the temporal bone is right there. Styloid is Greek for pillar-like because in that red, the circle shows it uh, as this pillar-like structure for muscle and ligament attachment. Then we have the mastoid process of the temporal bone gets its name because it's breast shape and it's the on the back of the ear like that. It's where the sternocleidal mastoid muscle attaches. Now there's an opening here. It's an important clinical opening. And so anatomist said, what do we call this opening that's between the styloid and mastoid processes? I know, we'll call it the stylomastoid foramen. And the stylomastoid foramen is what traverses is traversed by the facial nerve proper. So there's our facial nerve, there's the facial nerve proper, there's the facial canal, and there we've got that facial nerve proper that traverses the stylomastoid foramen, and then the facial nerve proper goes through the parotid gland and innervates all the muscles of facial expression. There, at the base of the skull, is the stylomastoid foramen for facial nerve proper. Now, the frame and magnum, frame and for opening a magnum for huge. There it is. And it's important because the frame and magnum is traversed by the vertebral arteries that supply the posterior part of the brain, spinal accessory nerve that innervates your traps and sternocleidomastoid. It goes through the frame and magnum and then back down through the jugular frame. It's kind of a cool course. And then the most important thing, that spinal cord is what traverses the frame and magnum. And that, my friends, is an overview of the skull in a nutshell. Mm -hmm.